The Etruscans were Rome's northern neighbors, occupying the Italian peninsula before the Romans, and have always been considered by scholars to be a rather mysterious group of people. It is still unknown exactly where they originated from, but seem to have settled in the Italian peninsula beginning around 1000 BC. So here we see a map of the Italian peninsula with Rome located advantageously on the Tiber River in the middle where the Latin tribes had established themselves. The Etruscans occupied virtually all of the north portions of the Italian peninsula, while the Greeks, during the period of colonization, settled southern Italy and Sicily. Virtually nothing is left of Etruscan cities today, but we do know that they established their cities atop very well-defended positions uh, on citadels with steep slopes that made attacking the citadel virtually impossible. Another interesting feature of Etruscan communities are the so-called cities of the dead, as we see here in this image on the right. These were literally cities established in order to contain the bodies of the dead. And so we see here several examples of the tombs of the Etruscans called tumuli. They are carved from soft volcanic stone called tufa. That's easily worked, but when it's exposed to air, it becomes almost as hard as rock. So we see these cities of the dead featuring primarily these dome-shaped circular tholoi, but occasionally rectilinear structures as well, with streets and avenues separating them, just as what happened in the city of the living. To go inside one of these tombs is rather interesting because they appear to be based upon actual Etruscan homes. Of course, none of these homes remain today, but Scholars believe that the tomb interiors were based on interiors of Etruscan homes. So here we see the Tomb of the Reliefs that features niches or loculi where the dead would lie. If you look carefully into the lower right-hand corners of the niches, you'll see stone pillows upon which the dead could rest their heads. And then on the walls, you see relief carvings of various everyday implements, as well as armor and weapons. And then looking at the ceiling, you can see a simulation of beams and rafters that gives us an idea of what the interior of Etruscan homes may have looked like. Be aware that this would have all been painted to give a more appealing, homey look originally. Their sarcophagi are very interesting, as we can see here with this well-known one. They're made of terracotta. The figures are approximately life-sized. But the thing that's most interesting about them is the relationship between man and wife. Especially given the condition of women in the ancient world, usually they occupied a very secondary position to their husbands. But among the Etruscans, they appear to have somewhat equal status, uh, as would be indicated by the rather loving and intimate kind of relationship between husband and wife here on the lid of this sarcophagus. And of course, inside the bodies would be, would be laid out. Now, the style is rather archaic. It's similar to the archaic period of Greek figure sculpture. And the position of their hands would suggest that they were holding something probably a goblet of some type, possibly as a consequence of funeral feasts that seem to be typical of Etruscan peoples. Here's another example of this reclining on a bed that we see both in the first example and in the pillows and the niches of the Tomb of the Reliefs, where we see this woman lying comfortably on her bed and pillow being covered by a blanket, sleeping into the eternities, so to speak. Notice that this is a later figure, given the fact that it is more realistic than the earlier one. And then we have this last one that I want to show you that shows a little bit more classical look to the figure, so obviously a much later product than the earlier ones. But again, we have husband and wife in a close embrace, lying on their bed, covered with a blanket, and cuddled together, showing a distinct element of tenderness in their relationship as they sleep into the eternities.
So in terms of their artwork, we see virtually everything coming from the funerary associations. That's because the cities, for the most part, are no longer extant, and so we don't have any public artwork that has been retrieved from investigations and excavations of ancient Etruscan cities. So whatever artwork we have, like the figure sculpture and the paintings, in this case, figure work, comes from the tombs. So here we see a fresco, and they did work in fresco with rather bright colors in a very strong, bold style outlined with uh, thick black lines and very simple flat colors for the most part. Gives us a rather somewhat comic book look or a very graphic look to their figure work. But here we see a typical activity among the Etruscans in which they are celebrating a festival apparently with music and dance and their colorful costumes. Here's another piece that shows the exuberance of the poses that are depicted in much of Etruscan artwork, where we have dancers here, both male and female. Again, the bold graphic figure work, along with the flat colors and the dark black outlining as this couple dances exuberantly in a landscape. And then here we see a little bit the wider view of a tomb painting where you get the idea of the coloration that some of these tombs would have possessed and then featuring what appeared to be a very common activity among the Etruscans which was feasting, celebration of life, celebration of death, and other kinds of opportunities to gather and feast together. And then the last one is this image of a couple of athletes wrestling perhaps the forerunner of Roman gladiatorial combats, which were originally celebrated as games at funeral celebrations as well. So here we have a couple of wrestlers engaged in a contest at a funeral games. And as I mentioned earlier, the Romans will borrow gladiator combat more than likely from their Etruscan neighbors. In terms of sculpture, I'm just going to show you this one. This is called the Apollo of Vey. Vey was a town, it's about 10 or 15 miles north of Rome, and was a very early enemy of Rome, and one of the earliest cities that the Romans captured was the city of Vey. So here is the Apollo of Vey. This is made of terracotta. It's about a life-size, a little bit larger than a life-size figure and would have occupied the ridge pole of an Etruscan temple. I'll show you a little bit later what Etruscan temples are believed to have looked like, but this would have stood on the center of the ridge pole or perhaps out on the facade. Difficult to know exactly, but it's interesting to compare this to a contemporary piece from Greece, which would have been a, a Kouros figure such as this. We, can, we saw with the Kouros figures how it's a very static figure. And by contrast, the sculpture of the Apollo is much more active, much more dynamic in its pose. So this is an example of what we believe the Etruscan temples would have looked like. Now again, none of these have survived because they were all made of perishable materials. But scholars have a fairly good idea of how they would have looked from the writings of the Romans at the time. So let's identify some of the characteristics of Etruscan temples. You see, of course, that they have a gabled roof and columns out on the facade in the porch, but other than that, don't look much like a Greek temple. So here are some of the most obvious characteristics. And we'll compare it with the Greek to remind you of what a Greek temple would look like. And so one of the most obvious things is that it does not sit on a crepidoma, these layers of steps, that platforms that the Greek temples were raised upon, but rather sits on a single high podium. Secondly, we can see that since it does not possess series of steps leading up to the stylobate, instead we have a single stairway access, axial alignment in other words, so that there is only one way of entering into an Etruscan temple as opposed to their Greek counterparts, or you could get up to the floor level of the Greek temple from any direction. 
Next, it has a very deep porch with some widely spaced columns. You notice that by contrast, the Greek porch is not as deep. So the, the, the uh, cult chamber, which we see here on the Etruscan temple, the cult chamber here is only, is only built back to the second row of columns, whereas here it's significantly deeper. And then finally, and perhaps most characteristically, is the full width cella. The cella is the cult chamber here, and you can see that it occupies the full width of the podium from side to side. And as we look at the top and dissolve away the roof, we can see that inside, instead of a single cult chamber like the Greeks, the Etruscans had three cult chambers and pedestals upon which statues of the deities would be placed. So the Etruscan society was a very vibrant and strong and energetic kind of society. However, it consisted of independent city-states. There was never an Etruscan kingdom or an Etruscan empire. Instead, a series of city-states, each one controlling the territory around it, like we saw when we discussed the Greeks, very similar to that. When it came time to confront an opponent, then they typically fought independently, even though they did form a federation of Etruscan city-states. They did not come together necessarily in times of crisis, but instead fought individually. So eventually, when a powerful opponent came along that threatened their hegemony, their control of northern Italy, like the Romans did, then there was very little that they could do to try to oppose the Romans other than in individual conflicts between city-states and the power of the Roman legions. So it reminds us a little bit of the story of the Haratii brothers, where the last brother is able to overcome his three opponents by causing them to separate from one another through exhaustion and then defeating them one at a time. Basically, Rome does the same thing here with the Etruscans, handling each city-state individually until she has overcome all of them. So let's take a quick look at the growth of the empire. Even though we are talking about a period of time that is the Republic, it's common to refer to the growth of the Republic as a growth of empire as it swallows up and consumes state after state after state. So here we see our map of the Italian peninsula with Rome situated very advantageously in the middle of the peninsula on the banks of the Tiber River, as we've talked about before. Initially, it was a part of the Latin tribes that occupied central Italy. And the Latin tribes were the first groups of people to fall to the power of Rome. And as I may have mentioned before, when Rome defeated a tribe, it didn't just enslave them, but rather made them a part of the growing power of the city-state of Rome itself, incorporating their economy and their manpower into the Roman state, thereby becoming more powerful itself and then being able to expand out from there. One thing I wanted to mention here is that in my first lecture, I may have left you with the impression that Rome was a very benevolent and generous master. Be aware that when Rome needed to be violent and ruthless and bloodthirsty, it was. It did not hesitate to do so and did not hesitate to enslave people that it considered its enemies. Rome eventually became a society that was very strongly based on slavery. And so that would indicate to us that Rome was not just forgiving of its enemies, but could be a benevolent master if its enemies submitted and agreed to do things in the Roman manner. So basically, around 600 BC, as we've talked about before then, in the growth of the empire, we start with the expulsion of the Etruscan kings that ruled the city in 509 BC. From that point, Roman expansion begins, beginning first with the Latin tribes, and by 300 BC, the Latin tribes are all defeated 
and have been incorporated into the Roman state, and now all of central Italy is controlled. Of course, when that happens, Rome is going to come into inevitable conflict with the Etruscans in the north and the Greeks in the south. And so that's what happens. And eventually, by 275, the Etruscans are defeated one after another in the north, and then also the Greeks defeated in the south. So by 275, Rome has control of the entire peninsula. So they're masters of all of Italy by 275 BC. Then in 216 BC begin its overseas adventures. So as we talked about in our last lecture, the first Punic War in 216 BC fought over the possession of the island of Sicily. And of course the, the Carthaginians were defeated in that conflict. And as a consequence, Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica are added to the growing power of the state and control of ter foreign territories. Now we're going to have to go to a larger map to continue our look at the growth of empire. By 200 BC then, we have the Second and Third Punic Wars, and here is an image of the way Carthage may have looked on the north coast of Africa. And you see there in this area a very interesting kind of harbor that was circular in shape, built to accommodate the great fleet. But the total destruction of Carthage brought on the addition to the Roman state of the Spanish coast and the Balearic Islands, which had been under the control of Carthage. Then by 100 BC, virtually all of Spain is added, along with southern France, Greece, and Africa. And then by 20 AD, with the conquests of Julius Caesar, Caesar Augustus, and the imposition of the Pax Romana on all of these territories, virtually all of the Mediterranean came under the control and mastery of Rome. Now, the Pax Romana means the Roman peace and is a term that's applied to this period of time when, after being conquered by the Romans, the Romans enforced peace throughout their territories. And then by 100 AD, the limits of empire have been reached all the way from Britain in the north to North Africa in the south and Egypt, and from Spain on the west all the way to the Persian Gulf on the east. Now eventually, this portion of the empire will be lost to a growing power from Persia, the Sasanians, but at the limits of empire it controlled this amount of territory. So now let's take a look at the Roman Republic and the artwork and architecture that was developed during this 500 year period of time. So here we see the foundations of Rome being laid for the great empire that will come. So you have probably all heard of the seven hills of Rome. So here we see a physical model someone has built of Rome in its earliest stages. They're on the banks of the Tiber River here we see the Tiber Island, and then a bridge where the river is shallowest that afforded the crossing of the Tiber from north to south. So what we have here in this model is a representation of the seven hills upon which the city was established and expanded from. If any of you have been to Rome, you know that the hills are still there, but they certainly are not as extreme in terms of their elevation as we see in this image here. Over the centuries, the hills have mostly worn down to very subtle elevations, but not with the extreme palisades that we see represented in this model. The Capitoline Hill and the Palatine Hill are still fairly elevated, but the rest of them are not quite so obvious as we see here. So what we've got is the Palatine Hill, this is where supposedly Romulus first established his city. Uh, later on, this will be the, the place where Roman senators, Roman aristocrats, and the wealthy of Rome will build their villas is on the Palatine. And then later on, the emperors will occupy the summit of the Palatine Hill. Then we've got the Capitoline, 
which is the hill upon which the main temples and religious district of Rome will be located. So the great temple to Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Jupiter the best and the greatest, will be located here on the Capitoline Hill. If you remember the large white monument to Victory Manual, that's located here on the back of this, this north side of the hill today. So here we have the Aventine, a residential district. And in between the Aventine and the Palatine is a valley in which is located today the Circus Maximus, the great chariot race course. Then we have another residential district, the Calian, then the Esquiline, the Viminal, and the Chirinal. So there are the seven hills of Rome. And then at the foot of the Capitoline and in the valley between the Esquiline and Palatine is the Forum. This is the center civic district and mercantile district of the city is in the Forum. Every Roman city, no matter how small, had a forum. So here is a comparative view from Google Earth of Rome with the location of the hills as it looks today. Here is that monument to Victory Manual right here, and right in this position there approximately would have been the great temple to Jupiter Optimus Maximus. And of course, in this image, you see the Colosseum, which of course would not have existed at this period of time. We'll take a look at the Colosseum in greater detail a little bit later. And then here in this image, we see the curve of the Tiber River, the Tiber Island, a modern bridge that crosses the Tiber today. But as we see here, spanning the width of the Tiber River from, from shore to island and then to shore again is the oldest bridge in Rome. One of the most remarkable achievements in ancient Rome was to be found in a revolution in architecture. Up until Rome, almost all cultures used the same basic method for constructing a building called bearing wall or post and lintel. So the main problem that the Romans are going to face is how do you create a large building with a very spacious interior? Now remember that the Romans were very practical, down-to-earth sort of people and very civic-minded with a strong intent for accommodating social interactions. Therefore, it wasn't enough to just construct a building. You had to make it not only impressive in size and scale and appearance, but also make it accommodate large crowds of people. So as we can see here in this structure that we're looking at here, this is the facade of a temple in Egypt, as you can see from the sphinxes that line the processional way here. And by comparison to the scale of the people, the tourists here going in through the entrance way, you can see it's a very large structure. So huge, really. This is the temple of Karnak as found in the city of Thebes, a ancient capital of Egypt. These temples were very large and impressive in their construction and in their decoration. Here I've created a little model to give you an idea, though, of the problem with structures like this. So here's my little geometric guy that I've placed in the scene in order to give you an idea of the scale. Now, what we're going to look at here is called a hypostyle hall a space just beyond those great gates that we were just looking at. The hypostyle hall was a very large space, in the case of the Temple of Karnak, consisting of some 60,000 square feet. So as we pull back here to give you an idea of this area, you can see that most of that space is occupied by columns. So therefore, not particularly accommodating for large groups of people. And that's because these temples were never intended to accommodate large groups of people, quite frankly. So they didn't need to have a lot of interior space. But a very large structure with a very large roof that needed to be supported. And in order to hold that roof up, you had to have a forest of columns, as you can see here. And you see my little guy down there very, looking very lonely 
in amongst this veritable forest of columns. So how much usable space is there in a building like this? Well, of course, very little. So here is a photograph of the interior of the hypostyle hall at Karnak. And as you can see, crowded with a myriad, a multitude of columns. So just a review here briefly of the architectural systems that had been developed in the ancient world. In other words, ways of supporting a roof, holding a roof up. So one of them is called bearing wall. And of course, and we've seen examples of this, either of raw stone or of ashlar masonry, where blocks of stone are stacked up to a certain height. And then its width is constrained by the width of the wooden beam that is used to support the roof. So the walls can only be as wide as the beam can support without collapsing in the middle. So as you can see from my little guy here, that not very large space inside. A better system is called post and lintel. That's where the walls are built with ashlar masonry but then the ceiling, the roof, is held up with posts, columns, and lintels. Architrave here, for example. With this kind of a structure, of course, you can have a very wide space inside, just like that template Karnak. You can have a very wide space, but since a stone beam or a wooden beam cannot span a very great distance without breaking, you have to have a great number of columns inside to be able to hold up the roof structure. So therefore, again, a large interior space is possible, but how much usable space is there? And then the last one is a tholos, a round building. So we've got a bearing wall structure below, and then in order to roof it, you're using corbeling, where each course of stone projects inward from the one below it until they finally meet at the top. And then that's covered over with dirt. Now all of these work effectively, but none of these make spacious interiors possible. So the Romans, being very clever and practical engineers and designers, will come up with two very successful innovations. One is going to be the use of arches, or what we refer to as arcuation, like we can see here in this aqueduct. To complement that, they develop a very useful type of material, concrete. Now this would surprise many modern day people to know that the Romans developed a very effective type of concrete that they were able to use to construct most of their largest buildings. So we see here concrete filled with rough rubble and then faced with bricks. So let's take a look at how the Romans used concrete in building their structures. So in terms of Roman wall work, there are specific methods that they used. One was called opus incertum. So we see that here. This looks like a building that has been made of stone, but in reality, this is concrete faced with stone. And this method of stone facing is called opus incertum, which means irregular, randomly placed stones embedded in concrete. So here we see a second method of facing concrete walls with something more appealing than bare, rough concrete. This is called opus reticulatum. What it consists of is diamond-shaped grid of brick embedded into the concrete. And then finally, the last one, opus latericium. In opus latericium, we see bricks called dipedale, in other words, two foot. That translates into two foot. So very large bricks laid in courses, embedded again in concrete and mortar. Opus latericium. So here's an example of how a wall built with the opus latericium would be made. So triangular bricks are placed on the outside of the wall, and then the space in between is filled with concrete in this manner. So here we see a little animation. 
showing the dipedales being laid in courses on one side of the wall and then on the other side. And then once that is done, the intervening space between is filled with concrete, resulting in a building such as this. This is called the Aula Palatina and is a large royal structure that appears to be made of brick, but in reality is a concrete building made with the Opus Latericium method. The advantage of building in this method is that you have no need for wooden forms to create your walls. Now, typically, if you've ever watched construction work taking place, the construction workers will raise two wooden panels or panels made of some other material that are about six or eight inches apart, depending upon what they're building. Brace those securely, and then in the intervening space in between, pour their concrete. Let the concrete set, then you remove the forms, and you have a freestanding concrete wall. In the case of Opus Latericium, you eliminate the need for wooden forms, and then when you're finished, you have the added benefit of the fact that the exterior has a pleasing brick look, like we have here on this building. So here we see, back to this image again, an arch made of concrete filled with rubble, and the rubble is there in order to strengthen the concrete, and then faced with Opus Latericium. And so we've got bricks embedded into the concrete to make a more pleasing exterior appearance. So the advantage of concrete is that it is strong, strong as stone, once it has dried, and concrete is much more flexible when compared to ashlar masonry or other stonework. So when you're building from stone, from ashlar masonry, you are restricted to certain kinds of shapes that you can make with uh, stone blocks. However, with concrete, because it is a fluid in its initial stage, you can build any kind of wooden form of any shape that you want, pour the concrete into that form, let it set, and then you can remove the form, and the freestanding concrete will take on that type of shape. The types of shape that were very difficult to achieve with ashlar masonry. Also, another distinct advantage is it's much less expensive than ashlar masonry or other stonework. That's because you don't need any skilled labor to be able to generate concrete. Instead, all you have to do is take the materials, mix them together into a container, and anyone can do that, even I can do that. Go down to Home Depot, buy a sack of concrete, take it home, pour it into my wheelbarrow, pour in a little bit of water, mix it up, and I've got concrete that I can lay for a patio or whatever. So you don't have to have skilled labor to do that sort of thing. And it's easily constructed. You just have to have the proper materials. It may surprise you to know that the concrete was first in use all the way back in 300 BC. However, it will become widely used, interestingly enough, during the time of Nero, 64 AD following the great fire of Rome, and we'll talk more about that when we get to that period of time. But it's during the time of Nero that concrete first is used widely for all kinds of urban constructions and not just specialized buildings. Now, concrete is made by mixing a powder with water and then putting something like gravel or some other fill into it. Romans, as you can see in this image, didn't use gravel. They used chunks of stone or pieces of broken brick or tile or whatever you could use to throw into the concrete. Today, the type of powder that we use is called Portland cement. But in those days, the Romans used a very high grade of volcanic ash called pozzolana. And this is readily available for the most part throughout much of Italy, since Italy is a volcanic zone. But some of the best was found down near Naples, a place called Vesuvius, near the volcano. And so, readily available volcanic ash. Now, this would be mixed with water in order to come up with a paste that could be then poured into a form of some type and allowed to harden. 
One of the advantages of Potolana is that it was capable of hardening even under water. So you could build harbor foundational structures or a river crossing bridge supports with Potolana concrete. So you might build a wooden form, sink that into the river bottom or the seabed, load it down with heavy rocks or whatever, and then somehow, and I don't know how this was done, but somehow get the concrete into it. And once it was there, it would harden even under seawater. And then you could either remove the forms or just let them rot away, it didn't matter, in order to create harbor structures like this one that we see on the coast of Israel today. So here we can see some harbor structures. This was from the time of Herod, first century BC, in which this was one of his royal cities that he built as a seaport. Israel typically doesn't have good port facilities, and so Herod had Roman engineers design these port facilities using Pozzolana-based concrete. And you can still see some of the structures of which this port was made. So here is an artist's representation of the way it may have looked. So we've got the mole coming out here. That would be this part right here. And the two harbors on either side. So there we see the advantage of Roman use of concrete. Here we can see the advantage of arcuation. So in the Forum of Rome, we have the remains of what was one of the largest so-called basilicas in the ancient city. This is the Basilica Nova, or the Basilica Maxentius. A basilica was a public building that was used for all kinds of public gatherings and activities intended to hold large crowds of people. And so here we see the advantage of both concrete and arcuation in what remains of the Basilica Nova. So we have these three large bays that feature the use of the arch, the barrel vault, and not the dome here, but the dome is also a, an arch, but simply rotated in 360 degrees. So domes are made possible by the use of concrete. So the advantage of using arcuation in a situation like this is the ability to span very wide spaces with no interior support, so large unencumbered interiors, as we see in this example. So, by contrast, again, we return to the temple of Karnak, the hypostyle hall at Karnak, and we see these huge columns and congested space. And we refer to this as architecture of mass, because when you look at it, what you see primarily is the solid structures. Here I place one of my students in the midst of these columns to give you an idea of the scale. So very large, but encumbered spaces. On the other hand, here is our Basilica Nova, exploiting the arch and the barrel vault. And the barrel vault is this space here, that's like half of a barrel, which is created by simply taking an arch and extending it into space. So we have a barrel vault without any interior supports, then featuring also these recessed panels here called coffers for decorative purposes and also to lighten the load, quite frankly. And to give you an idea of how this qualifies as architecture of space, let's place a couple in here so we get an idea of the scale of the space that results from using arches and barrel vaults very significant advantage over post and lintel, which is basically all the ancient world prior to the Romans had. So let's talk a little bit about arches and the nature of arches and what is necessary in order to make them work. They're very effective in terms of the physics of architecture, but how do they work exactly? So here we see an arch that is incomplete. Arches are not self-supporting until the keystone is put into place. So without that keystone, they would collapse. So how do you build that arch shape and put the keystone into place in a practical sort of way? Well, the thing that you need to build an arch is what's called centering. 
Centering is a preliminary arch built out of wood. And so here you can see a wooden centering placed on two support blocks. And then once that's been built, then you place what's called voussoirs over that centering. And the wooden centering holds the arch in place until the keystone, the center voussoir, can be placed into its position. Once you have done that, then you can remove that centering and the arch will remain self-supporting. However, keep in mind that it's only self-supporting if it has exterior supports on the base. So without that, it will still collapse like this because the downward pressure will force the voussoirs apart. If they don't have lateral bracing, then it will still collapse like you see here. So with some lateral bracing like you see here with these blocks, it could be stone, or if this was an arch of a bridge, that might be the embankment of the river itself. But in any case, once that lateral bracing is in place, then the arch can be self-supporting and can support a significant amount of weight. So through the use of arches, the Romans are able to create some very impressive pieces of architecture. But let's talk briefly about trouble with arches and another significant Roman invention. So the trouble with arches is when you take an arch and you extend it into space horizontally, you create what's referred to as a barrel vault, like we've seen already. However, the physics of this kind of a round-topped arch is that it places a great deal of pressure right here where the arch meets the wall. Okay? So a great deal of pressure is applied right there because the wall, the arch, just because of physics, is trying to push the walls apart. That's going to result ultimately in something like this. The whole thing is going to collapse. So how do you prevent that? Well, you have to counter this pressure somehow, this lateral pressure. And the way typically that you would do that is just simply by creating massive buttressing along this entire length of the wall like you see here. If this is thick enough and solid enough, then it will counter that lateral pressure. The problem with this is that putting windows or openings into this wall would weaken it and thereby precipitating collapse again. So the only place that windows are possible with a barrel vaulted type construction is here in this non-weight supporting end, this end and the other end. Now if you have a small building like in my example here, then those windows would be sufficient to provide adequate lighting. But if it's a large building, like that Basilica Nova, then that's not enough lighting. So the use of barrel vaults results in inadequate lighting for the interiors. Well, the Romans came up with a very clever solution. The Romans are nothing if not clever engineers. When they face a problem, they find a solution to it, typically. And the solution here is to take two barrel vaults, conceptually, not literally, but conceptually, take two barrel vaults and intersect them at right angles, like this. So by conceptually intersecting the two barrel vaults, you create what's referred to as a cross barrel vault. The advantage to this innovative application of physics is that now the stresses, instead of being focused along the entire length of the wall, which needs to be buttressed then, is focused in the groin, the joint, or the barrel vaults intersect. And then in addition, those stresses are focused downward or channeled downward into the corners here, so that all you have to do is reinforce some massive piers at each corner. The advantage to this structure is obvious, and that is you now have spaces where you can place windows on all four sides instead of just two sides, like we see here. And when you do this, now you increase the amount of illumination in the interior. Then if you need a larger building, you just take this module 
and you repeat it a second time. Now you have a larger building. And a third time. Okay. You've got windows below and the partitions and the spaces above. You have larger windows as well, providing plenty of illumination into the interior of these buildings by using this system. So we see that here in the Basilica Nova. Here's my model of the Basilica Nova, a fairly plain looking building on the outside, but on the inside, these buildings would be lavishly appointed and beautifully decorated with statues and mosaics and veneers of beautiful stones from around the empire. So here we see the cross barrel vaulting in this system being used in the roof. Okay. Here we see the actual building with these three large bays. And we do a cutaway so we can see where those bays would have been. Then we have this large nave or aisle in the middle. And on the other side, we see the three corresponding bays. So all together would have created an enormous interior space with virtually no interior supports. And as you can see with the people that I've placed in here to give an idea of scale, a building like this could contain thousands of people at once. The type of goal that the Roman engineer is trying to achieve for civic purposes. So now let's take a look at Roman temple architecture. As you look at these two images, the question is, which is Roman and which is Greek? This one over here is obviously the Greek building. Therefore, this is the Roman one. So what is the difference between them? What distinguishes Roman from Greek? Well, the thing that helps you to identify Roman temples is the fact that they borrow elements from the Etruscans to incorporate into their temples, as well as elements from the Greeks. So let's identify, first of all, the elements that are borrowed from the Etruscans. This temple is a temple that is found in southern France and is, as you can see, in very good condition and shows us a fairly typical example of a Roman temple. Now let me put up a Etruscan temple here for comparison so we can see what they borrowed. Obviously, one of the things that they borrow is the high podium. And you can see how very high this one is by this guy standing near it. So it's about, what, 12, 13 feet high up to the level of the temple itself. Then in addition, we see the single stair access leading up to the front of the porch. And then a very deep porch. And then a full width cella. Now, the consequence of a full-width cella is one of the most distinguishing differences between a Roman temple and a Greek one. So let's take a look at the Greek elements. So here's our temple of Hephaestus from Athens. We can see that they've obviously borrowed the architectural orders. In this case, obviously, the Corinthian order is being used here. Now they have a pedimented roof that's obviously borrowed again from the Greeks. Sometimes they will not have sculpture up here. Sometimes they will. Same way with the frieze. You can see here the frieze has no sculpture, nor does the pediment. So they have borrowed the architectural orders. Now the other thing that they borrow is the peripteral colonnade. So we have a peripteral temple here with a colonnade all the way around as being typical of Greek temple architecture and the Romans are going to borrow that. However, because they also have borrowed from the Etruscans the full-width cella, they can't have freestanding colonnade. So what we have here is what's referred to as engaged columns. In other words, here's the wall of the cella, okay, goes all the way out to the edges, and if you're going to use a surrounding colonnade, you can't have these columns be freestanding, but need to be engaged, or sometimes referred to as a reserve column, engaged with a wall. So as a consequence, this type of temple is called a pseudo-peripteral temple, fake peripteral, so to speak. I just wanted to show you before we leave this temple at Nîmes, just wanted to show you this photograph of an earlier time when the temple was still quite dirty from pollution. A good deal of time and money was spent to clean this up and 
looks really nice without all the dirt of pollution covering the walls. Now the Romans with these advantages of arcuation and concrete are going to generate what is perhaps history's best example of architecture of power. In other words, architecture that a state or an individual uses to project its power to the public. And as we can see in this Monument to Victory manual, this gives us an idea of what is meant by architecture of power. Anyone seeing something like this just innately knows that whoever created it was a very important and powerful individual and wealthy. And so this is, architecture is a way of projecting, in a propagandistic sort of way, projecting a state's power or an individual's power, an emperor's power, and so on, is through the architecture. Now, this was a specialty of the Romans when it came to trying to show their domination of the territories that they occupied. Everywhere they went, they created buildings that would express this power. Now, you can imagine someone from one of the provinces, distant provinces, say maybe Britain, for example, traveling to Rome to either conduct business or to bring a petition to the emperor or to the consul the leader of Rome, and coming into the city from their little daub and wattled villages with dirt streets, coming into this metropolis at the center of the world and being confronted with paved streets and statues and fountains and magnificent structures soaring about them on every side, how that would have impressed and intimidated them in terms of Roman power. So the Romans used architecture in a very propagandistic way, oftentimes. So this becomes an expression of the imperial spirit. So by contrast, here is the way the Greeks may have approached their public architecture. So here we have the Temple of Hephaestus in Athens, perched on its hill, nestled in among a grove of trees, accommodating itself to its environment beautifully. This, on the other hand, is a Roman temple. Now, this is just a model, obviously, because the actual structure no longer exists. It has been built over almost entirely by a medieval Italian city, part of which has been excavated to show portions of this. But in any case, this is the Roman approach to the relationship between architecture and its environment. It doesn't nestle itself comfortably into the environment. Instead, it imposes itself onto the environment and forces the environment to conform to its needs, to its design. And so, and again, architecture of power. This is the sanctuary of Fortuna Primagenia from the second century BC. And is a good example of using architecture to project the irresistible power of Rome or even nature herself is forced to kneel before Roman will, to bend herself to Roman design, terraforming the entire hillside to conform itself to the design of the temple. Now be aware that this isn't a temple that you're looking at here. This is just the theatrical stage setting for the temple. It reminds us a little bit of the altar of Zeus and Athena with these projecting colonnades here and the terraces and courtyards framed by it. So we have this ramp leading up to the main staircase, which leads up through these colonnades and vaulted niches onto the main terrace, and then on up from there past this little theater and on past, again, a structure that reminds us very much of the altar of Zeus and Athena. So this is all just a very lavish, theatrical setting that is intended to introduce the visitor to the temple itself. So the temple is a very small Tholos temple located right back there. Here's another 3D model that shows the temple in the background. So all of the rest of this is just theatrical setting for the temple. Now here's the actual structure today. You can see the ramps, the entrance ramps here that represent these ramps here, the entrance ramps there, then on up through the central staircase, onto the terrace, then on up through the theater, 
And then back here behind would be the temple. So as you can see, the city of Palestrina has taken over the entire structure, but has been subsequently excavated to show us what parts of it may have looked like. So those are public buildings meant to project the presence and power and importance of Rome. But of course, people had to have a place to live in the city of Rome. And so let's take a quick look at domestic architecture. So here we see my model of a design that may have been typical of a street corner in ancient Rome. Now some 90% of the population of Rome lived in structures such as this one right here called an insula or an insulae for the plural. So these basically are apartment buildings. Again, made of concrete and brick, opus latericium, in order per to provide housing for the majority of Rome's population. Now at the height of Rome's power, some scholars suggest that the population of Rome may have been around one to one and a half, maybe even two million people. So 90% of that population could not live in ordinary houses. Instead, they lived in apartment buildings, just like we do in cities today. So here's an example of an apartment building, an insula, that consists of no more than five stories. They were limited by law to five stories, anything taller being considered to be somewhat structurally unsafe, and so by law, limited to a height of no more than five stories. And then these apartments would be crowded full of low-income families, the poor crammed inside these apartments just like landlords tend to do today. The lower levels would be occupied by shops or maybe by more wealthy merchants that are maintaining the shops or whatever. And next to it would be the urban villa of perhaps the patrician who owns the insula and from which he gets some of his income. Now be aware that the upper floors did not have running water, so if anyone needed to have water, you came down to the fountain in the square, and you got your water from one of Rome's very numerous fountains found on many of the street corners, with water freely flowing 24-7 for anyone's use. So here's a view of the remains of an actual city street this is from a town called Ostia, not too far from Rome. It's actually Rome's port on the seacoast. So here we see some insulae lining this narrow street. And of course, the street's fairly narrow in order to maximize living spaces. And the buildings constructed of opus latericium, brick embedded in concrete, lower floors being shops, upper floors, what what remain of them being the apartments. So you got a paved street down here. You have paved, would have been paved in those days, paved sidewalks with curbing and drains underneath that would carry away wastewater down to the Tiber or to the seacoast or wherever. Now, people living in these complexes, of course, one of the conveniences that Rome and designers provided for the inhabitants of these insulae were bathroom facilities. Individual apartments did not have running water or bathroom facilities, so they had to come down to the street for those things. We saw how they could come down to the street to get the water from the fountains, but what about bathroom facilities? Typically, these were areas that were built behind the insula and to which anybody could go. So here we see an example of a communal toilet. In those days, the Romans did not insist on privacy while doing their bathroom duties. So here you see a communal toilet. Residents of the insula would come down and use them as needed. So according to one scholar, oftentimes Roman citizens would be conducting business while taking care of their business in a place like this. So you might have a shop owner using one seat. You might have a fishmonger using the other seat. You might have another fisherman sitting on this seat and all conducting business among themselves. Seems odd for us, but perfectly normal from the Roman point of view. So here there's another example, a larger communal toilet. 
with curved edges instead of these rectilinear ones. Same overall design philosophy. So a question that often comes to mind is, well, what did the Romans use for toilet paper? Because they didn't have toilet paper. So what did they use? Well, interestingly enough, they used something like this, a sponge on a stick. And so one of these would be sitting at each toilet and would be used as necessary. So how did they use such things for such delicate activities? Well, you can see here in front of the seats, you've got this channel. you got one here too in this one. That channel would be filled with running water. So you'd have water running along the channel at all times that would complement the channel underneath here that also carried running water, carrying the wastes away to the sewer system. And so after an individual, a patron, was finished doing his business, he would take the sponge that would be resting here against the bench, dip it into the water, and proceed to use it, rinse it out, leave it there for the next occupant, and so on. So an interesting aspect of ancient life in urban Rome that probably doesn't resonate very well with most of us. So in terms of domestic architecture, the villas of the wealthy and the upper class patricians would be borrowed from the atrium house of the Hellenistic era. So this is a cutaway view of a 3D physical model of a typical atrium house. What we have here as an elaboration of Hellenistic atrium houses would be the single entrance again coming in from the street leading into the atrium. You can see the atrium is dominated by a pool called an impluvium and above it would be an open roof sloping downward so the rainwater could run into the pool and then be stored in a cistern down below for household use. And so this would be the atrium and the impluvium. Then beyond that, the reception rooms for the man of the house where he would meet his guests or his business partners would be received in the reception rooms. And so here we see what remains of an atrium house in Pompeii. This is all reconstructed above here because it would have been destroyed in the eruption of the volcano back in the first century AD. But we see here the actual entrance to an atrium house with the open roof, the impluvium, and then the rooms on the outside. And then behind, we see a garden area, which would be this area over here, the peristyle court. So the peristyle court is a colonnaded walkway where the family could gather in leisure times. There would be probably a little pool there, some plants, flowers, shrubs that would create a pleasant environment for a, spend a few hours in the afternoon. Maybe among the shrubs, you might have the little statue of the little boy pulling a thorn from his foot or the little naked cherub squeezing a goose from the Hellenistic era. Those would fit nicely into this environment. Then beyond that, we've got the bedroom or private spaces, kitchens and so forth, spaced around the center of the house. So here we see the floor plan of a very wealthy patrician. This is based on a floor plan from Pompeii. So a very extensive urban villa in this case. So the houses for the rich and famous is what we're looking at here for the most part. This one is a fairly complex structure with two entrances, one coming in through here, one coming in through there, and that leading back to the peristyle court and then ultimately all the way back to a garden area in the back. So many of these urban villas, if they had room within the city spaces, would have a garden area in the back that would be used for creating produce for the household. So here we see a full-scale example of lavish urban villas that would be occupied by wealthy patricians or senators or people of upper class status. This is a building that was actually copied from a villa in Herculaneum, the sister city to Pompeii, called the Villa of the Papyri. 
So this villa was excavated back in the 18th century, and J. Paul Getty, the wealthy American newspaper baron, decided to have a copy of this villa built for him as a mansion in Malibu, California, where this is found today. So this is the Getty Mansion, part of the Getty Museums in Malibu. And it gives us an idea of the very lavish accommodations for the wealthy in Rome. So here's a ground level view of it, showing the pool surrounded by various trees and bushes, and shrubs and sculpture statuary lining the banks of the pool and the shaded colonnade along which the occupants of the house could stroll at leisure in order to enjoy what is referred to as otium. Otium among the Romans was a very highly prized pursuit in which basically it was leisure time, very sophisticated use of leisure time, which the wealthy all highly valued and prized as part of their lifestyle. This included sitting around in places such as this, carrying on enlightened and sophisticated conversations or the study of the classics or talking about political affairs or whatever it might be. Otium, a very important part of Roman upper-class life. Just another view of the gardens here at the Getty Mansion.